So, we get all these little hints and teases at the diamonds, but most direct references have been to what they even are, but not who they are, or what they did, or, or just why. I mean, we technically don't even know where they even are, or what they look like. Or do we? As far as we are aware, there are four diamonds which exist, these being yellow, blue, white, and pink. It is possible that there are more, however, as there are two extra panels at the very top of the mural, with all we can tell being that they depict the contrast between night and day, and how in the original drafts for the episode series Steven, we have what appears to be a black diamond in the center instead of rose. Sadly, there's no further references to these potential other diamonds in the show, either implied or directly stated, at least as far as we realize. So, we have our four for now. While it's near impossible to speculate on anything that occurred before the war, we actually have a pretty good grasp of what happens afterwards, and that's where we get to the good stuff. They're all dead! Well, except Yellow, anyway. White Diamond is center right in the mural, seen fighting against Rose Quartz. The gem found in the pyramid where this mural can be found can also be described as being a white diamond. Let's also not forget the fact that this pyramid is located in the middle of the battlefield, so we can be rest assured that White was slain as a direct adversary during the war, and has been left there for quite a while until the Crystal Gems have bubbled her safely inside of the Crystal Temple. Now, there are some theories which do say that this figure is actually Blue Diamond, due to the apparent water motif under her and what appears to be a blue hue to the mural's image. Now, I'm not denying either of those possibilities, because as far as I know, I, mean, I don't really know what that platform is or how people may perceive color in such an instance as this. But the rest of the evidence involving the battlefield and what we actually find in the pyramid seems to more strongly correlate to this figure being the White Diamond. It'd also be needlessly complicated if you ask me of oh, the irony. If we are to believe that Rose Quartz is Pink Diamond, check out my previous videos for that one, then we can safely say again that she isn't with us anymore, since she became a part of Steven. Even if you're still unconvinced of that theory, it's still safe to assume that Pink Diamond just simply isn't an issue as far as we can tell, what with having her symbol removed from the Diamond Authority, and there being no modern mention of her aside from Pearl's spacesuit, which is a dubious proof at best to say that she's somehow still around. This brings us to Blue Diamond, and she gives us a little bit more trouble than the others, but once again, viewer, this diamond kicked the can quite some time ago. In her mural, we see a horde of hands grasping at her image, but the image is pretty creepy rather than a little more comforting like Yellow's portrait. There are several possible candidates for her gem since the series first aired, first with the Moon Goddess statue. This makes sense if you consider her mural as representing her as a godlike entity being worshipped by others. And the blue association with the statue, the fact that the statue is found in a tower that's underwater, practically, these all share traits and values with her diamond. Other possible locations for her gem's final resting place is the lighthouse above the Crystal Temple which appeared in the Horror Club episode, as it shared a very similar size and shape to the white diamonds from Sirius Steven. Alternatively, there is the Crystal Temple itself, as it is shown to be a large structure capable of manipulating space, similar to the Pyramid Temple from a while back. But it isn't likely to be powered by Pink Diamond, as there's been no mention of this, especially if we believe that Pink Diamond is Rose and that the diamond is split between herself and Lion instead. Blue Diamond is currently an extra floating around, so it would be a sufficient power source for the temple. Regardless, if we don't know where her diamond is located, we can still be sure that she is still out of the picture just like the others, and we know this because of Lapis Lazuli. Lapis is clearly associated with Blue Diamond, as indicated by the design of her clothing, with the Blue Diamond forming the top portion of her dress. However, when she returns to Homeworld, her presumed superior is never mentioned. Rather, it is Yellow Diamond who is calling the shots. This is very strange, because if we are right in assuming that gem culture is a strict hierarchy, Lapis really wouldn't have to listen to much of anything Yellow Diamond has to say. She's Blue's servant, not hers. And even if we say that somehow Lapis was given into Yellow's care from Blue Diamond, it's within reason that Blue would be pissed if she found out that Lapis was being treated as a prisoner, despite her willingness to cooperate the whole way through. After they had captured the Crystal Gems, there was really no reason to keep Lapis as a prisoner, 
Even if her loyalty was in question before this, she should have been in the clear by that point. Even if the Diamonds are generally jerks to those lower than them, I doubt they take kindly to other people messing with their, well for lack of a better word, property. Or stuff, as Peridot elegantly puts it. Yet, never once is Blue Diamond ever mentioned by any character, as though she doesn't even exist. And as far as I'm concerned, she probably hasn't sensed the Rebellion, with the hands seen being those of uprising gems, but the mural is still left ambiguous. Or maybe... Blue is still alive? At first, I really wasn't convinced of this theory, and I personally don't like it. But if I'm supposed to do my job right, well, I can't argue when I have the numbers staring me in the face. Fact of the matter is, Blue Diamond is none other than Lapis Lazuli. Now, to prove this, we're going to have to smoke a little bit out of the science and theory crack pipes to make sense of it all. So buckle your sanity in, because it's time for <laughs> SCIENCE! There's a bunch of vague and curious statements made by Lapis when she was first revealed in relation to who I am, and she also had a very unique reveal, with all this crazy geometry coming from the water as soon as she arrives. And yeah, she's also stupidly strong, also she's blue, but this isn't science, okay? We're still missing two key factors for being a diamond, which I explained in earlier videos. These being that they are fusions, which we currently can't speak on as to where or who is the other half of Blue Diamond, and that they're the only gems capable of manipulating space-time. At the end of Ocean Gem, we see that Lapis Lazuli flies off into the void of space. And later on in the episode The Message, we see that Lapis has arrived on Homeworld. We know that Steven Universe, at least in the first season, has a chronological episode flow over about the course of a year. Ocean Gem takes place at the beginning of summer, and given that the message occurs towards the end of the season, that puts it at some point during the winter. For simplicity's sake, let's say that Lapis arrived at Homeworld within six months. Now, where is Homeworld in the grand scheme that is the universe? While it is technically impossible to get a perfect answer, as finding stars and planets typically requires us to know how much energy we receive from them, and what their parallax is, neither of these are values that we can find by looking at a computer screen image of a cartoon universe. We can, however, get a fairly clean estimate. There is one definite image of the star which Homeworld orbits, once again seen at the end of Ocean Gem. Using this image, we can find the value of the star's apparent magnitude, a measure of how bright it is to someone just looking at the sky, relative to other things that we might see. So, for something to even be visible to us, it has to have an apparent magnitude of 6.5. For an absolute lower limit, I say that negative 13 is a good candidate, this being the maximum brightness of the moon. Cause if a star is brighter than the moon in the sky, I'd say we have bigger problems to worry about. However, this is still quite a large range of numbers to do equations with, so, for closer numbers that one can argue, but which I personally think makes sense, we will use negative 3 and 0, the apparent magnitudes of the planet Jupiter at its brightest, and the star Vega, respectively. With these apparent magnitudes in mind, we can begin to do some equations by plugging in the possible luminosities of various types of stars. Luminosity is the measure of how much energy a star emits, and we have plenty of good estimates, at least for the typical stars of the main sequence the main sequence being a band of stars associated by color and brightness, and for the most part accounts for all of the typical stars that you can encounter. Everything from red dwarfs to red giants are on the list, and while the values of luminosity technically go from a very tiny decimal to one million, thankfully the list is logarithmic, so we actually just need to run equations based on the number of zeros, thus reducing the amount of number crunching. Speaking of which, let's get right down to it. We can find a star's absolute magnitude from its luminosity value, and with both magnitude values, we can get the star's distance in light years from Earth. This gives us a range of distances, telling us that Homeworld's star is somewhere between a hundredth and 1,115.4 light years away from us. That's pretty bad, because the minimum is right on top of us. So we need some more limits on where Homeworld could possibly be. While there is no set limit for how close two stars can safely exist near each other, we can be rest assured that our solar system, even in Steven Universe, is largely the same as it is in real life. If that's the case, then we can remove any result that is under 1.5 light years. 
This is the radius of our solar system, including the Oort cloud, which can be safely said to be the edge of our system's border. For another star or an entire system to be within this range would change a lot about how our solar system operates. So, we know that Homeworld is at least 2.8 light years away, at most 1115.4, and Lapis traveled this distance in... six months? Now, I know all of you Einsteins have been raising your eyebrows for a while now, but bear with me on this and it'll all make sense in a bit. Kinda. We'll need the good old velocity equals distance over time equation to find Lapis' speed. Let's use the lower value first and convert light years into meters. One light year is about 9.5 quadrillion meters, it's a lot of zeros, and the time is 6 months, which we will convert into seconds. Giving us a final speed of about 1,650,000 meters per second, for comparison's sake, the speed of light, the fastest possible speed in the laws of physics, is about 300 million meters a second. Note, we can also find a possible speed for Lapis by simply multiplying the speed of light by the number of light years and multiplying it again by 2. This gives us a slightly lower number, so I'll be using this method to get the rest of the values. And remember, viewer, speed is power. By plugging these values into the equation for joules, a measure of energy, let's just say that Lapis weighs about 140 pounds, or 63.5 kilograms we get about 89.5 quintillion joules. For comparison's sake, that's like being hit with the Tsar Bomba. <laughs> the world's most powerful nuclear weapon, 426 times at once. Beating three gems at the same time? With over 21,000 megatons of power, that isn't even close to what she can really do. And this is if we're being conservative about this. If we use the largest possible distance, then Lapis is moving at a speed of 668 billion meters per second and hits with a whopping 10 septillion joules. And you want an example of that? That's about as much as 3% of our sun at any given second. 3%! Fine, here's a visual for you. Oh, viewer, this is just the beginning. While this proves that Lapis is the hands-down most powerful gem to date, especially considering that she is only half of a diamond fusion, this is much more than just her power level. Diamonds are unique in that they can alter space-time. So far, we've mostly just seen the space portion, with Lion producing wormholes and the two temples blatantly contorting space and matter, but Lapis is the first gem we've seen to control the second attribute. As an object approaches the speed of light, a notable phenomena occurs which is called time dilation, or the Lorenz factor. Put simply, it is how one's perception of space-time changes as one moves, with a value of 1 being how we would see and feel reality every day. As one increases in speed, however, the value increases. The higher the value, the slower time appears to move from the point of view of the moving object, among several other changes. Once again, in very simple terms, a Lorenz factor of 1 is a 1 to 1 ratio. But 10 would indicate that for every second you move, everything else is moving 10 seconds slower than you would expect. This increases all the way until you reach the speed of light, at which point, time would stop for the object that's moving. But, even at a minimum, Lapis can move faster than light. The equation and the laws of physics will begin to break down. When one moves beyond the speed of light, an imaginary number is required to make sense of the equation, this number being the square root of negative 1, otherwise called i. Also, it's worth mentioning that technically all of the work that we did on measuring Lapis's power is bunk because accelerating to the speed of light ought to require infinite energy in the first place. So we just crash on theory and forever think that Lapis just found a warp pad on Mars or something? Well, let's take a step back and remember that we're discussing our cartoon where this didn't manage to put a hole in the east coast of the United States. With the show's apparent art physics occurring at convenient times, and assuming that the theory of general relativity can still use some work, Let's say that accelerating the light speed isn't as difficult as we imagined, and in fact one can move faster than that. 
perhaps gems are somehow able to increase the speed at which their photons operate at. What would happen then? Well, allowing the square root of negative 1, time dilation would then work backwards, such that the faster one moves, the faster everything else around it reverses through time. Or a little more technically, for every second that passes for the moving object, negative seconds pass for everything else. Now, assuming the lower speed of a billion and six hundred thousand meters a second, Lapis's time dilation is nearly 0.18i. So, for every second that passes for her, everything else rewinds at an eighteenth of a second. If she holds that speed for six months straight, she would arrive on Homeworld nearly three billion seconds before leaving Earth in the first place. That's more than a month back in time. If we were to say that Season 1 takes place equally over 12 months, Lapis would have returned to Homeworld at about the same time that Steven was dealing with his own timey-wimey adventure during Steven and the Stevens. A very interesting coincidence that we'll delve into later. But, what if Homeworld is over a thousand light years away? Running the numbers again, Lapis's time dilation would instead have to be 2,230i. But that would mean that Lapis Lazuli would have been on Homeworld a thousand years before she left us alone on Earth. Now, I know what you're saying, because honestly, I said it myself while running the numbers. There is no way that Lapis could be a diamond, let alone blatantly breaking general relativity. But that's just the problem. Sure, we don't really know just what gems are truly capable of, but we do know the true capabilities of one thing, light itself. In the message, the cast receives a video message sent all the way from Homeworld in six months. Light simply cannot move faster than itself. I mean, come on, that even sounds silly. I move faster than myself? What is that? Plus, it would definitely destroy our understanding of how the universe would operate at any scale. It would take nearly three years for the cast to have gotten that message. An extra month from Lapis's time dilation isn't going to do anything. Not at five light years, not at ten, not at a hundred, not at three hundred. But over a thousand light years away with one thousand years of bonus time? That works. Lapis did send an electromagnetic communications message to Earth as soon as she got to Homeworld, warning us about how advanced they are. It just took a thousand years for it to actually get to us. There just isn't any other way to allow that. Without this entire time-traveling FTL extravaganza, this episode simply couldn't have happened! At least not until Season 3, but by then it'd be long after it'd be of any use to the cast. Lapis Lazuli is half of Blue Diamond. We found her on Earth after what we can assume was thousands of years after losing the war. Steven freed and healed her, and she chose to return to Homeworld, arriving a thousand years before Steven even found out she existed. Before Steven existed. And she's been on Homeworld for the last thousand years. Why? What has she been doing? And more importantly, what has Yellow Diamond been doing during all this time? Why are the gems even here on Earth? Well, dear viewer, stay tuned for the next politically apocalyptic video to find out. That is, if you can wait. <laughs>